Welcome to Unmuted. I'm Judge E.J. Russell, and we here at Unmuted want to keep you informed and educated. Unmuted will feature a variety of guests, including politicians, community leaders, entertainers, decision makers, and others addressing news breaking issues and compelling concerns to the community and nation. If you would like to contact us, please send an email to unmuted at myyahoo.com. Today's guest is Representative Zakia Summers, representing Hines County and Rankin County in the Mississippi House of Representatives. We are going to go unmuted and talk about House Bill 1020 specifically and any other things that might come up as a result of that. Welcome to Unmuted, Representative Summers. Thank you so much, Judge, for having me. Well, we are going to dive right in. I stayed up on, was it Wednesday night, to hear the debate on House Bill 1020, which is designed to create a new court, expand jurisdiction for the capital city improvement plan, and take away some of the powers of the city of Jackson. Talk to us about your thoughts on House Bill 1020. Well, like you stayed up uh, late into the night listening to the debate, uh, many of us had a hard time actually going to sleep that night because it was such a strenuous uh, day. As you said, House Bill 1020 uh, would create and what, what I call it is a separate but unequal court system specifically for the Capitol Complex Improvement District. Uh, the court system would be made up of two judges, four prosecutors. The two judges would be appointed uh, by the Chief Justice, not elected. And the prosecutors uh, would also be appointed by the Attorney General, not elected. Uh, that is one of the really specific harms to House Bill 1020, in addition to some of the other information that's included in that. And we, you know, flat out say that House Bill 1020 is unconstitutional on its face. As you know, Judge, the Constitution provides that judges are elected. They are elected by the people of that jurisdiction. And what this bill would do is actually disenfranchise the citizens of the Capitol Complex Improvement District from exercising their constitutional voting right to be able to select those individuals. What has uh, Representative Trey Lamar, who is the bill's sponsor and a huge advocate for the expansion of the CCID, Capital City Improvement District, what is his argument when it is brought to his attention that this bill may be highly, strongly, may be unconstitutional. What is his argument? Yeah, so there are a few things that he's using to help promote this new separate but unequal system. And we have to keep in mind too that uh, Chairman Lamar is not from the city of Jackson. He's from Senatobia, but he has taken upon himself to tackle crime and public safety in the city of Jackson without even engaging with uh, members of the delegation about this issue, uh, without being from the community, talking with the community members at large, uh, he has taken it up on himself to, as he said, write this bill himself uh, to create a system um, that is simply unconstitutional. It's interesting, Judge, that you know now, um, that we are hearing so many incidents of crime in the city of Jackson. Crime is being used as the narrative to push some very targeted things at the city of Jackson. And I'm sure we're gonna be talking about some other pieces of legislation. Um, but we have to remember that this is a, a play out of a historical playbook. Uh, we remember the war on drugs and crime uh, we know that uh, the police uh, actually grew out of um, 
Reconstruction, when uh, slaves were emancipated and free, they had to come up with slave patrols. They created a system of convict leasing. Um, and so all of this is really uh, historic in nature, and it has a very, uh, a very heavy racial overtone to it that we're now beginning to see uh, Republicans use crime as a way to, I think, in my opinion, to attract voters, um, to try to take away power and control from black leadership, uh, to disenfranchise um, primarily black voters. And it's being used as a Republican play uh, in order to attract moderate voters and even some black folks that may be willing to vote Republican. Uh, but it's, this, this whole effort is being pushed under the guise of public safety. He told me himself and even said on the floor, you know, I want people to feel safe. I don't want anybody coming to uh, quote unquote our capital city and feeling like they can't conduct business or visit and play. And the reality of the matter, Judge, is that no one wants to feel like that. We all want public safety, and there are ways to go about doing that. Uh, the way that's being pushed through House Bill 1020 is not the way to do that. Well, and if his overarching argument for this system under the CCID is public safety and crime, and I, I quote here um, where Representative Lamar has said, uh, this bill is designed to add to our judicial resources in Hines County, not to take away, to help, not to hurt. But if that's what you're trying to do uh, to make it a safer community, why then are you appointing a judge to handle civil cases? Exactly. Civil cases are not criminal cases. That's right, that's right. So how does he justify that, if you know? Yes, yeah, so he's using um, a clause in the Constitution that allows for the legislature to create what's called inferior courts. And he described inferior courts as youth courts, um, as other courts that the legislature deems uh, to be put into place to be implemented in order to tackle a specific thing. And really and truly, the way that he's using this inferior court clause is, is only by name. It's not by reason. Uh, he says that he wants to help the city of Jackson, but what he's really doing is harming the city of Jackson. Uh, he says that he is concerned about the city of Jackson, but he's actually going to be causing a lot of chaos uh, as a result of this bill if it makes it through the process. If he really wants to help the city of Jackson and the judicial system that we have in place, the question that I posed was, well, why don't you provide supplemental resources to add to the system that we already have in place right now? That's something that we were able to do through the legislature uh, by way of our district attorney. We provided some additional funding for judges, prosecutors, uh, some uh, support staff to help with the backlog. But Judge, you and I know that the backlog does not cause crime in the city of Jackson. They're using that as a way to say, this is why we need this additional court. Um, I also asked Chairman Lamar, I said, okay, well, with two judges, and you claim we have such a large backlog, do you really believe that these two judges will be able to reduce that backlog in the way that you want them to? And he said, yes. The, uh, the fact that our city is the large, has the largest population in the state and the fact that we are coming off, and some would even agree that we're still dealing with the consequences of COVID. We're seeing crime, particularly violent crime, increase in high numbers, not just here in the city of Jackson, but all across the country. So this is not something that's unique to the city of Jackson. But what we have been advocating are other ways that we can help reduce this, this crime issue, this public safety issue. One of them, as I mentioned, is just adding additional resources to the city system we have in place, also providing some additional appropriations to our crime lab. We know that our crime lab does not have the capacity or the resources to be able to conduct investigations in an efficient way. And so that's one of the things that the state of Mississippi could, should be concerned about. Furthermore, Judge, the state has not done a, a, a very good job at handling the state's business. We look at what's happening with our health care. 
uh, in the state of Mississippi, we are going through a health care crisis. 38 hospitals are on the brink of closure. We think about the TANF scandal. We think about child poverty being the highest in the country. Infant and, uh, excuse me, infant and maternal mortality rates are also the highest in the country. The state should be concerned about those issues instead of coming to, into the city of Jackson and handling the city's business. Well, I can't agree with you more because I realized when they were talking about adding these separate courts and separate judges that the Hines County delegation, which includes, of course, the Jackson delegation, has asked for an additional judge for in years. That's right. Over the years. But the legislature didn't see fit to provide that kind of resource to Jackson because they thought they were going to hurt it. And it's playing out like a playbook that, okay, we have allowed these problems to uh, get worse and worse. And when a wound festers, then you have bad repercussions. Gangrene sets in. And that's somewhat of what the legislature has done with the city of Jackson. Now, we're going to take a break. I want to remind our listeners and watchers that you're tuned in to Unmute It with Judge E.J. Russell. Our guest today is Representative Zakir Summers, and we'll be right back. Welcome to the JMMF's Culinary Kitchen in partnership with Footprint Farms, the Farmer's Hands Markets, and funded in part by the W.K. Kelly by Humana. I am Chef Shishi, the owner of Just In Time, the featured chef of the JMMF Culinary Kitchen, where we prepare farm-to-fork-centered, healthier, all-natural foods in the urban community. Our menu includes salads made from collards, kale, and spring mix varieties, fresh vegetarian soups, and fresh juice elixirs made daily. We're open Tuesday through Friday from 11 a.m. until 2 p.m. And remember, what you put in your body is just as important as what you put on your body. We look forward to seeing you soon. Welcome back to Unmuted with Judge E.J. Russell, and we're going to continue our conversation with Representative Summers talking about House Bill 1020 in the Mississippi Legislature for the 2023 session. Now, um, Representative Summers, can you talk to us for a minute, though, about the boundary expansion that has occurred with the Capital Complex Improvement District? Absolutely. So the Capital Complex Improvement District came about in 2017, and it was really just to include areas of downtown Jackson. The position was that if we can provide some tax revenue into that area, and the concern was really focused on downtown Jackson, then we can improve infrastructure uh, and help to bring more tra traffic into the downtown area. Well, House Bill 1020 would actually expand the Capital Complex Improvement District and would increase it by twice its size. So it would go from um, Highway 80 over by the Battlefield Park area all the way to County Line Road touching uh, the city of Ridgeland from, Pearl, from the Pearl River side to State Street. Um, and because it was expanded, uh, the, the tax revenue percentage was also increased from 6% to 12%. And so we asked uh, the chairman if he had a fiscal note uh, to support this legislation. 
And what he shared with us was that it was going to cost the state about $1.6, $1.7 million for the court system. But what he left out was because the uh, tax percentage had increased to 12%, then $20 million would actually be diverted into the Capital Complex Improvement District. Now we're talking about $20 million that could truly help transform the current Hines County judiciary or even help with our police officers who we know are understaffed, who are underpaid and, would, and could also support our infrastructure needs across the city of Jackson. All of these things that I just laid out would have a direct impact on public safety. So true. And as we look at that 12% of sales tax dollars being diverted to this capital city improvement district, there's also a plan in here for the courts because you're going to have to house now two judges. That, you're going to have mm -hmm. to house four prosecutors. That's you're right. going to have to house four public defenders somewhere. And I understand the courtroom is going to be in the Woolfolk building in the current legislative budget hearing uh, office space. Uh, that's not going to be sufficient, which means that we're going to either see an addition or we're going to see someone lose their office space and be put in the basement somewhere. Uh, this, to me, is not a well thought out plan. Not at all. I mean, not only is it insufficient, but it just simply doesn't make any sense. You know, and we ask those questions. How are you going to protect jurors? How are you going to protect the defendant? Um, how can you truly hold court in an administrative building, a state administrative building? And so, you know, what what we've thought about is the state is probably looking to perhaps, you know, rehab a, a vacant building and create that as the new CCID court system. Uh, meanwhile, our Hines County judges are, you know, um, doing their work in a courthouse that needs, uh, that needs a lot of repairs. Um, they already don't have enough space to do what they need to do, and those are four judges. So I can't imagine, you know, how the state is going to be able to operate efficiently or effectively in the Wolf Oak building. The other thing, Judge, is, you know, what you mentioned in, in the previous segment is that this is not just circuit court judges. Uh, the, these judges will also be handling chancery matters. So we're talking about more than just felonies. We're also talking about misdemeanors. And the question that we asked on the floor was, where are you going to put these misdemeanor arrestees? The question was never answered. But there has been talk that there's going to be a partnership put in place with the agricultural commissioner uh, to create some type of holding facility on the fairgrounds. Now, you know, you and I know <laughs> that that has horrible connotations uh, for civil rights workers who were jailed on the fairgrounds during the civil rights movement. And so that's why we continue to infuse this, this racial uh, argument in our debate, because this is not the Mississippi that we want to return to. We want to move Mississippi forward. And we know that Jackson is an important part of that, which is why we should be working together to help Jackson, not working against each other. Well, and as part of this court system, there are some matters that will have concurrent jurisdiction with the uh, first judicial district of Hines County. It's going to take a minute for them to try to figure all of that out. There's uh, in the legislation uh, requirements for there to be a separate court clerk. Uh, to maintain the docket and uh, the filings, and then a mandate that the Supreme Court administrative offices of court will have to work and train those individuals who are going to uh, go over and work as a clerk there. And then the chief of the Capital City Improvement District Police Department is going to have over a hundred officers patrolling inside the city of Jackson. These jurisdictional uh, 
fights already exist with the feds, with the locals, with the sheriffs, and it's only going to be made worse with the Capital City Improvement District. Because where are they going to take all of these people that they are arresting? Are they taking them to a Raymond? And, and that was the question that we asked. Um, you mentioned about uh, a clerk. Uh, the clerk would also be able to set his or her own fee schedule. Um, you mentioned about how AOC, the administrative of courts, will be involved in this process. You know, I asked the question, I said, have you gotten support from the Chief Justice on this? The chairman said he had not spoken with him about it. Wow. I asked if he had gotten support from the Attorney General's office. Again, he said that he had not spoken with her about it. And so, as I said, this is going to cause a lot of chaos, a lot of confusion. You know, I don't know if they're anticipating uh, with you know going into contract with perhaps Rankin County or Madison County, the the neighboring counties to house individuals, but clearly this bill, the language in this bill, and the and the process and the outcomes of it were not thought out completely. And if this bill passes, we have an opportunity to kill this bill in the Senate. It has passed the House, but of course it has to go uh, to the other side, to the other chamber, go through the committee process and, and the whole legislative process before it comes law. I am hoping um, that our colleagues in the other House will see uh, this, that this is not the way that we should be moving forward. Um, I've heard from some colleagues that they may consider taking out the court piece of the bill um, because I think that they realize that if this is, and when, not if, but uh, if, if it passes, it will go to court. Um, that that will be a, a, certainly the next step for this piece of legislation because it is unconstitutional on its face. But if that part is taken out, then what's left of it is, of course, the expansion piece of the CCID as well as the money that will go to the CCID and the Capitol Police. So it's bad all the way around and it's something that the Jackson delegation stands firm on that this is not something we want in the city of Jackson. Have there been any actions to mobilize the city of Jackson to call the governor's office, to call the lieutenant governor or the speaker, to ask them to kill this bill? Absolutely. Um, as soon as we found out about this bill, we began to make contacts with the advocacy community. Uh, we have been in constant communication with uh, the People's Advocacy Institute, with Poor People's Campaign, the Mississippi NAACP, One Voice, ACLU, Mississippi Center for Justice, and a number of others. There have been daily calls with the advocacy community, uh, just making sure that we have open lines of communication. Uh, there's going to be a meeting with the business community coming up because the business community, community even submitted uh, a talking point sheet that we deliver to every state representative, letting them know where they stand on the issue. They too, and these are businesses in the CCID, they too did not want to see any support on this bill. Uh, we are also engaging with the faith community and a number of other organizations to make sure that we have a comprehensive front. Um, if this, this bill continues through the process, we have folks out on the street, we have folks that are making phone calls, sending emails, uh, meeting with their legislators, letting them know that Jackson is uh, strong, this is something that we don't want, and we are urging them to also vote against House Bill 1020. Well, and, and people need to be constantly reminded that this piece of legislation has more than doubled the size of the capital city improvement district. This bill has doubled the amount of tax money from 6% to 12% uh, that will be diverted from the city of Jackson and the citizens of Hines County. That individuals will not have the opportunity to select their judges. Uh, and are their prosecutors. This is something that every citizen in Jackson should be up in arms about. As you've stated, Jackson needs additional resources. However, there is a different way to accomplish what the 
House is has already passed and sent over to the Senate, but it's almost like the black folk in Jackson needs an overseer, a, a term from times of slavery, to make sure that they are doing what the other folk want to be directed at them. Yeah, and and it's just not going to end up good. Yeah. We're going to take a moment, hold your thought, and come back in just a moment to continue. Welcome to the JMMF's Culinary Kitchen in partnership with Prince, the Farmer's Hands Markets, and funded in part by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, sponsored by Humana. I am Chef Shishi, the owner of Just In Time, the featured chef of the JMMF Culinary Kitchen, where we prepare farm-to-fork-centered, healthier, all-natural foods in the urban community. Our menu includes salads made from collards, kale, and spring mix varieties, fresh vegetarian soups, and fresh juice elixirs made daily. We're open Tuesday through Friday from 11 a.m. until 2 p.m. And remember, what you put in your body is just as important as what you put on your body. We look forward to seeing you soon. Welcome back. You're tuned in to Unmuted with Judge E.J. Russell. Our guest today is Representative Zakir Summers from the Mississippi House of Representatives. We've been talking about House Bill 1020 and Representative Summers, you want to share with our audience your thoughts about the MAP expansion. Absolutely, so um, we talked a little bit about how the Capital Complex Improvement District would be it doubled its size um, with the passage of House Bill 1020. So what I wanted to do was to show the lawmakers exactly what it looked like because the chairman kept saying that uh, CCID would be, uh, you would be able to determine CCID geographically. And I wanted them to see that you could also make uh, demographic determinations on CCID because um, when we looked at the map and we overlaid the census numbers uh, within that map, it showed that there were a much higher number of white citizens, white residents, that live in the Capital Complex Improvement District compared to black residents. I also wanted to point out that because um, it has a majority white population in, within that boundary, um, the, the incomes are going to be higher uh, as a result of that. It's a more affluent area, um, has a lot of business community in the CCID. And because of those two facts, crime is actually not targeted in the CCID. Uh, crime takes place more so in my area, unfortunately, in West Jackson and in South Jackson. And so the position as to why we needed to expand CCID and create this unconstitutional judiciary system could not just rest on crime and public safety alone because the crime, again, is not targeted in that area. It really is uh, an effort to uh, create an island within the city of Jackson and my colleague brought up a really good point today. It really is also an effort to secede from the city of Jackson. Now that's an interesting point, that Northeast Jackson basically wants to secede from the city of Jackson, and perhaps that's the rationale for touching on Ridgeland, because now you're gonna suck that into that portion of uh, the CCID. Absolutely. I mean, I, I have no hardcore evidence of that, but it appears that that is a part of this push, is to really say we're going to make sure that we protect 
a certain uh, area, a certain population of the city of Jackson by throwing in so many resources. And we know that when we, when we think about how we can remove ourselves from an existing structure, the first thing that we turn to is police. We also turn to how we can create a different judiciary system. And we also turn to how we can uh, divide up the utilities. How can we pull resources away from uh, the city, one of the most important assets in the city of Jackson, which is a water sewer department. The other thing is we know that we're gonna be receiving upwards of $800 million, close to a billion dollars from the federal government to support our water system. And we think that this is all a part of a very punitive plan uh, that is very much money motivated. Wow, that is very deep and very thought provoking. And I hope uh, that those who are viewing Unmuted are listening and hearing what is being said because this information should help to drive you to the polls Absolutely. In, in November for sure. And the primaries of course come up before then. But I can't harp on it hard enough, loud enough, long enough uh, that you need to understand what is at stake here. That the resources are being raped and robbed from the city of Jackson. And then now we have this judiciary uh, that is unelected, you don't have a choice in the matter. They don't even have to live in the city of Jackson or the county of Hines to be appointed to these positions. That is uh, taking away your uh, suffrage uh, more than I can say, more than I can e even put emphasis on. So you need to be aware of what's happening and know, as I will always say, when voter, when people choose to vote, things can change. Mm -hmm. But you mentioned sucking away those resources. Let's talk about Jackson's water system and, and where it is at this point. We thought we had something about to happen when Mr. Hennepin came to town uh, from the EPA. I mean, he didn't work for the EPA, but they were the ones who somewhat assigned him here, I believe, or contracted him as a third party manager. So talk to me about that. Yeah, so we've seen several pieces of legislation uh, that have been introduced and that have unfortunately uh, passed either one side of the House. We had a couple of House bills and a couple of Senate bills that have passed as well. Uh, one of those bills was to change how uh, the 1% sales tax money is spent. Uh, when the 1% sales tax legislation was put in place and, if you recall, was voted on by the people of Jackson, uh, the intent of the money was to be spent on infrastructure, including streets, roads, bridges, as well as water and sewer. Well, the same representative that is behind HB 1020 who said that we need the best and the brightest to be on the court and they may very well come from outside of Hines County, is also behind this bill. And his argument for the bill was to prioritize how the money is spent. And so what was passed was that all money going forward from the 1% can only be spent on water and sewer. Never mind your other needs in the city of Jackson, that money can no longer go towards streets, bridges, roads, sidewalks, et cetera. Now also when that legislation was passed, uh, what the state decided to do was to put a commission over that money. And the members of that commission, the majority of them were selected by state leadership, putting the city of Jackson in a minority posture on that commission. But the commission determines which projects are prioritized, how much money is spent, when it's spent, they approve the whole process. And most of that money has been spent in Ward 2 and Ward 7, again, where most of your white residents live. We're finally seeing some action in South and West Jackson, but it's taken a while because those projects have not been prioritized. And we, again, believe that that bill is another piece to this punitive puzzle that is targeting the city of Jackson. 
just an outright assault on the city of Jackson. And then the, it, the timing couldn't have been more perfect right. uh, for that majority non-Jackson appointed commission that oversees that 1%. Uh, I believe I saw a report a couple of days ago that there was a contractor allegedly that had walked off of a project because they had not been paid. And I am looking to find out the backstory to that. But I found it very interesting that Republican Pete Perry, who is a 1% commissioner, brought that to the media a few days ago. Uh, so it's right in the middle of this whole uh, legislative session discussion about taking that 1% and doing something that the legislature didn't originally say the sole purpose of the money would be. So I found that very interesting. Mm -hmm. But then talk to us a little bit about this proposed regional uh, water board or commission uh, regional, but it's Jackson's water, right? That's right. And if you see the theme that is flowing through all of these pieces of legislation, it is really, um, as Senator Horn said, uh, a push to decapitate our black leadership. Because every piece of legislation takes control and power away from uh, the leaders that we elected as well as the people of Jackson. The Senate has taken it upon itself to pass a bill that would effectively create a regional board to oversee the water sewer system. As I said earlier in the show, the water, water sewer system is one of the most important assets of the city of Jackson. Now we already have a third party manager in place by federal court order that is responsible for the system as we speak. And we know that we're gonna be receiving upwards of a billion dollars to make the necessary fixes uh, in order to improve our system. And so they decided, the senators decided that they wanted to put a regional board in place following uh, the third party managers um, following his time here in the city of Jackson as the controller of the system. What's especially harmful about the Water Regional Board is that the city of Jackson would no longer own its own system because seven members of that nine member uh, regional board would not be from the city of Jackson. Uh, the, the nine member board would consist of five members that are again appointed or selected by state leadership. The other four members would be selected by the city of Jackson. However, two of those four members would be influenced by the city of Byram as well as the city of Ridgeland, leaving only two spaces on that regional board for the city of Jackson. So again, we see yet another uh, mechanism of oversight, power and control uh, against the city of Jackson. But help me and our viewers to understand how anyone in their right mind can think that this is fair and lawful uh, to be able to just take uh, the city of Jackson's water uh, sewer system. And this problem that exists with the water in Jackson, we're gonna hold my thought and we'll be right back with Unmuted with Judge E.J. Russell. Welcome to the JMMF's Culinary Kitchen in partnership with Footprint Farms, the Farmer's Hands Markets, and funded in part by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, sponsored by Humana. I am Chef Shishi, the owner of J
Chef of the JMMF Culinary Kitchen, where we prepare farm to fork centered, healthier, all natural foods in the urban community. Our menu includes salads made from collards, kale, and spring mix varieties, fresh vegetarian soups, and fresh juice elixirs made daily. We're open Tuesday through Friday from 11 a.m. until 2 p.m. And remember, what you put in your body is just as important as what you put on your body. We we look forward to seeing you soon. Welcome back to Unmuted with Judge E.J. Russell. We are here today with Representative Zakir Summers. Uh, with the House of Representatives of Mississippi, she represents Hines County and Rankin County. And I was just sharing how can anyone feel that this process of all of these oversight boards um, can, can be legal or constitutional or just plain old fair. And one of the representatives arguing against this bill the other night uh, made the analogy that $77 million was squandered from the tenant funds. But nobody is rushing over there to take over the Department of Human Services or take over the TANF program. That's $77 million squandered. In, in a very short period of time, yet you want to come into a city with elected leadership and just take over just because you can, because you have the votes. Well, that's that's exactly it, Judge. Um, you know, the my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, unfortunately, uh, don't consider fairness <laughs> in mm -hmm. much of anything that we do. Um, you know, the, the money that was misspent from the TANF fund is probably much more than that. Um, and what's been really uh, concerning about that whole issue is that we have not heard any response from leadership or from Republicans about that issue. Um, but yet we have used a whole lot of time and much more energy uh, to create this, this big X on the city of Jackson. They're coming after our land. As Representative Blackman said, this is truly a land grab. Uh, they're coming after our assets, that being the water department. They're coming after our leadership and they're coming after our right to vote. Um, as you know, Judge, uh, the Democrats in the legislature, we are in the minority. And, I, and when I say minority, I mean the super minority. Uh, when HB 1020 first came about, it was a three-fifths bill, which means that there was some money attached to it. Any bill that has money attached to it needs uh, 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 three-fifths of the House in order for it to pass. Um, that means that not only do all the Democrats have to vote in the affirmative, but we also need about three or four Republicans to join in with us in order to kill a bill. We felt like we had the, the votes to kill it. And then the, the Republicans, particularly the Freedom Caucus Republicans, must have complained about the fact that more money was being put into the CCID. And so what they did was they took that provision out of the bill, made the bill a majority vote, and we knew then that we probably, more than likely, we would not be able to kill the bill. We wouldn't have enough votes. Um, what's been especially, though, encouraging about our work is that we knew going into that battle that we were probably going to lose, but we debated that bill for about five hours. We had several members to ask questions, several members to go to the well, including myself, to speak against the bill, um, but we just could not garner enough votes um, in order to, to uh, kill it. 
Well, as we've said earlier, of course, Speaker Gunn has an iron fist on those Republicans in the House of Representatives. So whatever deal was struck before coming to the chamber was probably not going to change, regardless of what the arguments were. Uh, and I know many of those arguments were about this whole process being racially motivated. And a Representative Robert Johnson from Adams County made the point that it's not convenient uh, to argue racism uh, when it's real. And he recognizes it as what it is. Uh, also, a Representative Osborne, I really thought he was going to lose it there for a minute because he became extremely frustrated and agitated with some of the responses that were being received to the arguments of racism and how this is a money grab, a, a land grab, and a resource grab altogether. Uh, we were talking about that regional board and you're gonna have seven people who don't live in the city of Jackson. That's like having somebody come to your house and saying what you can and can't do, when you can turn your TV on, when you can turn it off, what time you have to eat. That's tantamount to what this board is going to be doing with the water in the city of Jackson. Absolutely, and you know, Representative Johnson is right. You know, when we bring up race, it's not because we are trying to, you know, have a dramatic moment. You know, we have to remember that many of our members, our black legislators that have been elected uh, into the House or into the Senate, many of them are over the age of 65, some over the age of 70, some over the age of 75. Mm -hmm. And they lived during a time where they were constantly um, discriminated against simply because of the color of their skin. I even heard that we had a couple of members that were born on a plantation. And so when they see these kinds of measures come to the table, it recalls a time, a traumatic past that they don't necessarily want to remember, but it has to be brought to the forefront so that people understand that there are racial overtones to the things that we are doing. These pieces of legislation are an effort to push back the rights of African Americans in the city of Jackson. With the history of Mississippi and the fact that Mississippi led the fight for voting rights for people of color all across this country, one would think that we don't want to return to a time where we are now um, saying that it's okay to disenfranchise people or it's okay that now we have black people sitting in positions of power. We want to take control of those positions and relinquish them from their leadership. Um, so again, these are not things that, that we you know, that we live to bring up, but these are things that we have to bring up because what we don't want to do is repeat past history um, that has not put Mississippi in, in its best light. Well, and, and voters, those listening, if you know someone who votes in Mississippi, they need to be rising up at this point in time in history to take a stand and to vote against some of these policies that we see are trying to turn back the hands of time. Uh, and if you don't speak with your vote, we're going to be lost and Mississippi is going to be back in 1864. Uh, a time when things were not as they are today and you won't be able to recover that power if we allow that power to be taken away from us. Uh, you know, this whole thing, and it may have started even before then, but one of the most prominent fights started with the attempt to take away the airport. Abs you know? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Again, it's it's a play out of a, a out of an old playbook. They have been inching away, and and several of my colleagues even brought up the fact that this goes all the way back to the board versus board, uh, the uh, Brown versus Board of Education. Look, I see it. 1864. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know there has been an incremental effort to try to roll back those rights. 
and to take control and to take power away uh, from 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 black people. Um, and and again, you know, this is not where where we wanted to head. There was something else that you mentioned that I wanted to talk about and the the, the it just escapes me. But but anyway, um, we've heard from judges. We've heard from uh, the prosecutors. We've heard from the business community. They don't want this. Nobody wants this. And it's it's very disheartening that we have a group of Republicans that think that they can come into the city of Jackson and tell us what to do. But let me remind the listeners and the watchers of this show. 2023 is a very critical year because we have elections this year from state governor all the way down to county court positions. We need people to turn out. We need people to get registered. We want you to go to the apartment complexes, the churches, into your communities, your neighborhoods, carry a voter registration application anywhere you go because unfortunately we don't have online voter registration yet, so we still have to do it the traditional way. But we need folks to get so upset about what's happening in the city of Jackson because it can be Jackson and Hines County now. It could be your city or your county next. And we need everybody to turn out to the polls this year. We can no longer afford to say our vote don't count. Our vote doesn't count when we can't go to the polls and elect the people that will have our best interests at heart. The best way for us to change course is to go out and vote and change the people that are in positions of power. That's how we're gonna turn this thing around. Well, once again, I repeat, when people choose to vote, things can change and your vote does count. Uh, you know, I, I often say, uh, the poorest of the poor has the same power with that person's vote as does a Bill Gates of the world who is a billionaire. But when it comes to that vote, you each have only one. That's and right. uh, this is for people who live outside of Mississippi. Hey, you need to be up in arms too, because if Mississippi gets away with this grab for power, then who's to say they won't be coming to your city in Alabama or your city in Boston next to try to do some of the same uh, kinds of things and when they figure out well this is a plan it worked in Mississippi let's see what we can do here judge that is such <sighs> an important point um, if you've ever read the book redemption it details the Mississippi plan following reconstruction and the measures that were put in place to to really um, attack and destroy and um, you know really go after black people during that time so that they wouldn't vote and they wouldn't elect people. If these kinds of bills making make it into law, we're talking about setting up a precedent that can go into other areas of the state as well as other areas of the country. And then let me just put it in biblical terms because Pastor Young said this last night. He said, you know, everybody wants me to make a statement, but I'm not gonna make a statement. My statement is going to be in action. And he used it this way. He said, faith without works is dead. He said, we can't no longer just talk the talk. We gotta walk the walk. Our vote is our voice. If you want your voice to be heard on these issues, you gotta go out and vote. Representative Summers, we could keep this conversation going probably for another hour, but our time is over. Thank you so much for joining us on Unmuted today. Thank you and, so much. And um, we will be in the trenches trying to make things happen. Thank Thanks. you so much for having me. You've listened to Unmuted with Judge E.J. Russell.